get to do this thing. Hi. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome everybody back. Can you hear me? As loud as I am, you can't hear me? What about now? Can you hear me? All right. Okay, I want to welcome everybody back. This will be our uh, first work session uh, on the new schedule where we're meeting at uh, 3 p.m. on Thursday before the regular council meeting, which will be uh, on the following Tuesday. So today is the 9th, and we will have the regular council meeting on Tuesday, uh, the 14th. I want to welcome everybody back. We have the public in here. Uh, tonight, they are socially distanced, and I appreciate that. It's good to see a lot of these very familiar faces uh, without putting anybody's name out there. So we've got a full schedule today, this afternoon. I, I want to get through it as quick as we can, but there's a lot of, of things that have gone on. We did not have a council meeting in, uh, in June. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first up is going to be community development, uh, Bobby Elliott. A1 culvert replacements, industrial park roads prior to paving. Go ahead, Bobby. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as a prelude to our paving project that um, is scheduled, the bid opening is scheduled for the 31st of this month, we've got about 4,600 linear feet of industrial park streets or roads, Fleet Drive and Andrew Way, that are in terrible shape. Um, those roadways have six culvert, drainage culverts that go across the road that were installed new in, in the 1980s. Corrugated metal pipe that's rusted out, deteriorated, needs to be replaced before the paving's done. Um, we um, <coughs> solicited six bid proposals. We received four bid prices. LCS and Associates was the low bidder. According to, to our cover sheet, I included that, $55,980. There's a wide gap between the low bid and the second bidder, but I couldn't stand up here and try to justify $65,000 left on the table. But, I am, but I'm apprehensive okay. because my engineer's estimate was pushing 100000 So uh, I understand from Mr. Barber that we are going to employ a uh, independent inspector to keep an eye on this project as well as the other two water projects that Pete has. Uh, that makes me feel better. But based on that, uh, the funding of this will be covered through our SPLOST paving dollars. Um, I'd like to recommend the low bid of LCS and Associates for $55,980 for the work. So, you know, when I first took a look at this, I, I thought the same thing, and this seems to happen more often than, than I would expect, that the low bid is such a wide gap from, from the second low bid, but we are uh, interested in saving money, saving the taxpayers' money, and I appreciate that, but I also appreciate the mitigating uh, supervision that, that uh, will be involved here. So, Council, do any of you have questions? Mr. Young. Um, if LCS does not meet our specifications or, or the, the, the recommendation of the manager we're going to hire to oversee this, do they have the wherewithal as a company to make it right? Yes. They, they, are, they have been in business for a, bit, for a long time, um, just not during my tenure at Villarica. Uh, they've done a, 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 a ton of water and sewer pipe work for Carroll County Water Authority. Uh, we, we've made a couple phone calls. So, and this, this, this particular portion of this project is labor only. Okay. In other words, the, the city will furnish all materials for this. And in fact, the, the pipe work is the next item on the agenda. So we felt like we could, we could get a better product cheaper if we furnish materials. Um, but I, I do think that they're, they're, they're substantial enough to stand behind it. I'm just worried about the huge gap. But that, you got you got recommendations. The people you called and talked to recommended them. I mean, we got a favorable recommendation from Carroll County Water Authority. Okay. Well, oftentimes uh, one of the problems that we run into, and in the way you can cut corners, is by buying cheaper material. Yes, sir. If we're providing the material, I mean, we sort of mitigate that right up front. Does anybody else have any questions? I have a question. Is this a 
I guess they refer to it as a not to exceed contract or can they come back and say, oh, well, now that we've um, actually been out here and we take a look at it, we're going to charge another $100,000. Matt, that's exactly what my fear is. Okay. But um, <clears throat> anything associated with that will have will be brought back to council. Okay. We well, don't, we, we, we met on site. We had a mandatory pre -bid meeting. We looked at everything. Uh, unless there's something out there that we didn't know about, which is always a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Well, the point of that is that you, you, they don't just have wide latitude to, to overrun the bid. Right. What he's saying is if you yeah. get out there and you discover something yeah. that any other right. bidder would have also discovered. Better okay. Back if, are there any more One questions? More question yes, sir. Also. Go ahead. I guess, Bobby, I, just, I didn't see in the packet the, I don't know, the supporting material for the, the different bids. Do you have, I mean, as like, far like for as example, in the water and sewer, we have. I have, I have the, the original bid documents. I have the actual bids. Mm -hmm. uh, bid documents were like 35 pages. Okay. And, but I've got all of that. But you reviewed those and you don't see anything starkly different between them that would explain the everybody everybody had to bid exactly apples and apples orange oranges and oranges it was a sealed bid process okay uh, by the book All right. thank you sir so that is the expectation but let me say even if it's 30 pages or 100 pages in the future i would like to see that okay. in the i know it's more work for the city clerk but uh, that is as part of of uh, reviewing these packets okay if there are no more questions i will uh, place this on the consent agenda if there are no objections no objections Okay. All right, Bobby, let's move on to uh, A2, pipe material for industrial park culvert replacements. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, the, on the cover sheet, here again, I got original bids for the materials. I could have attached those, and the next time I'll be sure to do that. But these, these, have, these are the quantities listed on the cover sheet as well. We, there are only two uh, reinforced concrete pipe suppliers in this area. Um, Foley Products is out of Noonan and Paulden Precast is in Dallas. Um, the low bid was $24,106.64. Um, we like, I've liked Foley for years. They, they have excellent products and uh, we like to recommend the low bid. Okay, this one is uh, much closer. Any questions from council? My only question is, so back in the 80s, CNP was the standard yes. and now it's precast concrete that's the standard now precast concrete should always be under pavement always okay um that is the standard uh, but it's, it's a gdot standard but back in the day it was cheaper okay. cities and counties put it in under roadways um but I, I i would never recommend putting any kind of corrugated metal plastic or etc cetera, etc cetera, under a especially an industrial part roadway right okay thank you sir any other questions there are no objections. I'll place this on the consent agenda. No objection. No objection. Nope. All right. Bobby, let's move to A3, price quotation on further engineering study of Punkintown Road speed limit reduction. Mr. Go Mayor, um, I did a single point data collection back in December on speeds classification on Punkintown. And uh, when you choose a spot to put your counter, A, you need a spot where you can lock it up so nobody will, you know, people will steal anything and vandalize anything anymore. And two, you don't want to put your counter in a curvy section of roadway because you get, you'll get misinformation on, on speeds. But we put this counter at the end of the guardrail before, if you're traveling north from I-20, uh, the end of the guardrail on the left before you get Shoreline Parkway. It's a straight section of roadway. It's the fast section, I like to call it. So it gave results that were not necessarily conducive to what it should have been for Punkintown and, and the condition of the road itself, especially on the north end. Okay. We submitted that to GDOT, and of course, by looking at the data, of course, you know. 85th percentile speed was at 52 miles an hour. Well, that's what they look at. The speed, whereas 85% of your people are going at or above, is what they look at. Well, obviously that was not the right answer that we wanted. So we got back with GDOT and we said, look, you know, this, we gotta do something else. Well, you can 
have a different study done that, that, that will take into the account the condition of the roadway, width of the lanes, condition of the shoulders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's beyond my scope in-house. I can't do that. Uh, so we've asked Ponding Company, since they are our contractor, our consultant for a transportation master plan, to give us a price quote on adding that to their contract. Okay. And that's where we are with this agenda item. For so $5,810, they will do this study and submit it to GDOT to for sure have a bearing on their decision on the speed limit reduction. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate you clarifying that. I knew that as our broader transportation study was progressing that we would get some information on Pumpkin Town Road, but it's mm -hmm. a little more, I think, urgent right now. Uh, Council, does anybody have any questions? Mr. Young. Uh, I uh, corresponded with uh, Michael Long at GDOT and, and trying to find out how it got a 45 mile an hour speed limit to begin with. And um, of course, Georgia's retention records uh, act is only for 10 years, so they, they don't have a clue as to how it got 45 miles an hour. Right. But I, I'm looking at I'm looking at Punkin Town at 45, and I look at Highway 78 at 45 miles an hour, and the, the nature of those two roads are completely mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the new study will do stopping site distances, roadway frictions, vertical and horizontal mm -hmm. curvature, um, super elevations, things like that, right. rather, th rather than just speed. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I probably could find some police officers that would agree that the 85th percentile is, is not necessarily valid because people don't make the right decisions. Well, the, the, the area where I had our counter, uh, it, it's more believable that, 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 that 85th percentile speed was at 52 miles an hour at that location, but that doesn't tell the whole story, not yeah, even half of it. Yeah, it's flat. I mean, it's got shoulder there. No drop off there. It's got the shoulder. Well, geometry it's is the geometry. But I can guarantee they come at that speed at times a little further down the road, right before they hit the curve. Oh, I yeah, <laughs> I can show you the data. We've got speeds yeah. as high as 70 miles an hour. Yeah, it's that crazy. Section. That's crazy. Okay, so, Council, do you have any uh, other questions? If not, I will place this on the consent agenda so that Bobby can get right to work on this. No Are there objection. any objections? No, no, no objection. objection. All right, Mr. Elliot, let's move on to A4, purchase of a John Deere Gator Model TS. I guess Mr. Davis is going to do it. Good to see you, Charlie. You too, sir. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I uh, have a request here from the Recreation Department to replace their John Deere Gator uh, two-seat vehicle with a small bed on the back. The one that they had the engine sometime last year locked up on it, cost of repairing it's within $1,000 of the new one on state contract and uh, something they really need to take care of the fields. I don't know why it didn't get done last year, but Tom asked me to get it taken care of. This is on state contract, and we would plan to sell the old one on gov deals as salvage. So this item was not budgeted, though. It was and not. we intend to, how do we intend to pay for this? I'm sure it's going to come out of recreation, but are we doing anything there, different? There's money left over in the uh, line item for the, fencing that was replaced on fields 9 and 10 at the V-Plex. Okay. And there's a little bit more than this left in there. That's right. Okay. I wanted you to, to say that. Okay. Council, anybody have any questions? Yeah, I had one. Um, I realize it's just we're replacing an item with a like item, but yes, there is no choice except that item. So give me whatever sales pitch you have on why that's the one we need to get. We have three of the same or four of the same types of models in the city, a couple at the wastewater plants, and then we have one in the grounds maintenance department just like this, and this was the one that we've used. They've used this model in the city for, I don't know, 10, 12 years, and they seem to hold up well, and it's one of the few that's on state contract. It's almost $2,000 below what it would cost if you walked in there. Because of the state contract? The state contract, okay. yes. Okay. Um, this is clearly a needed item. If there are no objections, I'll place this on the consent agenda. No objection. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, sir. Next up is Mr. Nick Griffin, A5 Pine Mountain Gold Museum Crossing Arms. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This item is to replace or to ask permission to replace 
four crossing arms that are located at the Pine Mountain Gold Museum around the track. They're at the entrance and the exit of the parking lot. We currently have four that are pneumatically controlled and they are getting increasingly worse as time goes on. Um, we're having constant issues out of them as they are operating. The state does mandate that we have them. We will fail inspection if they're not operational uh, when the fire inspector comes out. Um, the current systems do f work. They are functional, but they require constant parts, constant service, constant maintenance. When I say constant, it's about once a week that we're called out to come and either adjust these arms, replace parts, um, and really just kind of fine tune how fast they come down, how quick they come up. Uh, if there's, if the air compressors aren't working, if the air cylinders run dry, they start seizing. It's just a multitude of issues that we've been having to, to fix and maintain over the past three or four years. It is a budgeted item. Last year we, we put in the budget uh, around $54,000 to get a set of or a set of four crossing arms from Chance Rides, and that's the manufacturer that makes our train. Um, I reached out to the company uh, Train Works Global, and they also have created a similar system that's all mechanical. It's all gears and power, um, so there is no air compressor, and that's 80% of the issues that we have with these crossing arms. Um, staff's recommending that. We purchased four crossing arms that are completely mechanical from Trainworks Global. Um, Trainworks Global will also buy back the existing ones that we have for $700 a piece. It's not much, but it is something. Um, so how much time would you say you or your crew spend going out there? You said at least once a week, right? Yes, sir, and the, the time spent out there varies a great deal depending on the issue that we're having. Um, hypothetically say, it just needs an adjustment. We well, gotta go to all four of these. There's magnetic reed switches that activate these. So we're manually, um, I'm running on. We're spending, if, if it's just an adjustment, we're usually spending about an hour out there. If it's a parts replacement, then we're either headed up to Atlanta where the crossing arms are not functional until we get that part. Um, we're, some of the parts, such as the air cylinder that controls the up and down motion, those have to be ordered through Granger. They usually take a couple days. So while those crossing arms are down, the train is, should not be operational. It should not have passengers going around that track. So um, we could be in the middle of one of our events, whether it's the Halloween event or the Christmas event. It could be offline for several days. We have been in that situation. Okay. Um, so when you say we, do, is it does it usually take one guy or is it more than it, one guy? It usually always takes two because there has to be one person at the control panel or either the reed switch um, and one person either adjusting them or holding the crossing arm up, tying it up while we're replacing parts. So we usually always, it's always a two-man operation. Okay. All right. Well, as long as we're going to run that train, we're going to have to make sure that we, we have adequate equipment and there's no need to have this kind of downtime. Council, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Mr. Young? It looks like uh, the city is going to install these arms themselves. Any issues there? No, sir. We already have the power run. It's hard. The conduit's there. All it is is it's 120 volts. We hook it up, test it in pour, operation. Pour, pour a base for it? And we are. We, we're going to use the existing bases. Okay. Um, so all that hard technical work is already done. We also have a two-year warranty. Um, the owner of Classic Train Work or Train Works Global has, has offered if we have any major malfunction, he'll come out himself, diagnose and repair. Okay, anybody else? If there are no objections, I'll place that on the consent agenda. Thank you. No objection. Okay, next up is Mr. Zurbanos, Utilities, B1, bid award for construction of Highway 78 water main extension. Go ahead, Pete. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is a request to award a bid for the construction of the Highway 78 water main extension, which would uh, extend an uh, existing 8-inch line on the north side of Highway 78, 1,500 feet of ductile iron line, uh, and that would go from Dairy Queen to the Dollar Tree. Uh, currently, there's not a main on that side of the road, and um, we have some 
small services that are connected to the 12 on the south side that run under the highway and connect to several uh, residences and a couple of businesses there. Some of the lines are undersized. We need to clean a lot of that up and put in some new service lines, uh, set some new meters, and uh, get some of these lines uh, sized uh, appropriately. Also, putting a line there would also uh, be instrumental in providing more uh, flow capacity and for fire protection on that side of the road in the event that some of that property develops further in the commercial. Uh, we received five bids, and um, the low bid was LCS and Associates in the amount of 179 161 um, and therefore uh, the staff does recommend the project to be awarded to LCS and Associates in the amount of $179,161. Okay, Pete, when you describe that uh, extension, you, you, you describe it as being from the Dairy Queen to the family, uh, the Dollar General. Right. The Dollar Tree. The Dollar, Dollar, Tree. Tree. Dollar Tree. Back the other way. Yeah, okay. I, I misunderstood the two yeah, dollar, stores. dollar stores. Okay. Yeah. I'm good now. Okay. Yeah, poor Dana section. I'm good now because I'm actually thinking about a project we promised last year that we need to, to we'll follow up. Okay. This is okay. this project. I just want to make sure. The Leather Street problem and I, I for yeah, one appreciate that we're up. finally going to get this done because I keep getting the correspondence on this. Well, uh, we committed to doing it, and not, nothing really happens overnight, but it's not for us not making a good effort on it. Mr. Barber? So we, this is the result of what started out as the Leathers Road project. We have since discovered that there's a fourth meter that's also impacted. If you, if you are familiar with the little auto sales place out there, mm -hmm. um, a, an individual bought some land to the west of that for access to a parcel in the back which captured another water meter that's servicing a third parcel so when we build this line we're not only going to take care of the leathers road problem but we're going to relocate that meter back to the property of the customer whereas now it's a mess. No, but that I'm, I'm glad you clarified that. So we're going to fix four of them. That's that's really good. That's progress. Uh, council, does anyone have any more questions? Okay, if there are no Only, objections, go ahead. I'm sorry. Only question I had, um, I saw that it wasn't budgeted, but it seems like we approved this whole process a long time ago. Was it just it fell this, it fell too far into this year? Because I must seem like we were in budget meetings. Maybe we were just in the library for some reason. I'm, it seems like we were having the conversation about the whole problem and fixing it right out at Leathers Road when we were meeting in the library, which makes me think it, it was. I'll let you budget. clarify that, Pete, if you want okay. to. I don't remember. You don't remember. So we Not had a, a good amount meeting. of discussion about this, but mm -hmm. we never really did a budget amendment until we were able to find out what we were going to do. And I'm assuming we're going to do a budget amendment. Yes. Sir. Go ahead, Miss Sarah. And how much it was going to cost. Welcome, Miss Sarah Andrews, who is our CFO. Explain it to us. We will do a budget amendment. I'll bring that to the next meeting. And as, um, as y'all have made the hard decision over the last three years to raise rates, that has allowed us cash flow to be able to fund these out of our own um, enterprise funds. So um, we do have the available resources to pay for this. So it should be fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. No, I'm good because I felt like we knew we needed to do this a okay. long time ago. Without object, if there are no objections, I'll put this on the consent agenda. No objections. No objection. All right, <coughs> Mr. Zorbanis, let's move to B2 bid award for the construction of Edge Road Water Main Extension. Yes, sir. Um, this is to award construction contract for the installation of approximately. 5,200 lineal feet of 12-inch ductile iron water main. Um, currently, we have a 12-inch that runs down Edge Road on the north side of the road, about halfway down the length of Edge Road. 
it stopped short of uh, Wilson Street. And uh, it reduces down to a six inch line, which runs all the way down to Liberty Road. And so in order to increase uh, flow capacity and enhance fire protection, uh, it was recommended that we go ahead and extend the 12 inch through the whole length of Edge Road and connected at Liberty Road. Um, so we had seven bids that were submitted. Again, LCS and Associates uh, was the low bidder. And um, their low bid was $558,640. Uh, staff is recommending that LCS and Associates uh, be awarded the project in the amount of $558,640. And the budgeting for this is similar to the one that uh, Sarah just described. Okay, that's a, that's a considerable upgrade on Edge Road and no doubt it's needed. And I think uh, Mr. Carter will probably uh, appreciate that that will improve fire uh, service, uh, water access. Does anybody have any questions, Mr. Carter? Yeah. Uh, is Maple Valley feeding off of this water line? Um, off the new one? The one, the, the one once we do the extension? No, I don't believe it will be. Which that, would mean it hook into South Wilson, right? If it if Maple Valley Maple was off Valley it? Maple Valley is off of the existing 12 off, No, it's off the existing 6 inch. Okay, so that, Maple, Maple Valley, Valley is supplied by the 6 inch. Yeah, well he is in the subdivision on, on that side. But Sir, this 12-inch extension is going to replace that 6-inch. It'll run parallel to it. Parallel, so mm -hmm. we'll have a 6 on a 12. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. That's more of a comment than a question. This is another one that also is not a surprise. It's the reason we did all, those all that engineering and everything, and now we're finally fixing what we found out is wrong out in these areas. I never thought I'd get excited about water and sewer pipes, <laughs> but I'm so glad to see some of these things Two happening. Years. Is this a fix Two for years. the pool Two road so, fire? Yeah. Our problem? Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks, thanks Tammy. Thanks. I mean, yeah, that was my point about the fire difference. Uh, out there on Pool Road in that area. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir, Mr. Young. Uh, just a general comment. Now that the water and sewer fund is, is solvent and has money for capital, will we have to start budgeting that money in our budgeting process? That's a good question. Or does the, the enterprise fund typically have a more knee-jerk reaction kind of format? We will welcome the CFO back. <laughs> I think we know the answer, but let's hear it. Yeah, we will budget what we know. Uh, we did budget over $1.1 million in the 2020 budget for engineering for all these projects. Um, and I, I think, I guess, I don't, I don't know where we stood on where, how much we knew that this was going to actually cost. We so didn't. there was nothing to budget. But um, yeah, the pro projects we know, we're definitely budgeting for engineering and the projects you know, the estimates that we can, we'll be bringing to y'all those numbers when we um, do the budget process this year. Thank you. And I think that the point that Ms. McPherson is making is that for nearly two years, we talked about all of these projects that needed to be done and what we would eventually have to do, but everybody, we would hear feedback, you're not doing anything. But all of the studies were going on and all the engineering was going on, and now we're actually doing these projects. So I think that's, that's the point here. Are there any other questions? Okay, if there are no objections, I'll place this on the consent agenda. No objections. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Pete. Next up is uh, economic development. And it's going to be Wesley Behringer first. And that is uh, C1 Professional Services for Architectural Design and Documentation. Go ahead, Wesley. All right. Uh, to Mayor Council. So we have an opportunity here to get some architectural drawings created to step forward some of the projects that we've had in planning and we've been working on for a long time. Uh, specifically, these three projects are the barn, which will be the barn for the petting zoo and animal storage that's out there right now. And we have a staircase that goes down into the actual mine shaft itself. This will be a new attraction that we can add to the tours and sell. And then mine shaft coverings, which is kind of a safety slash 
upgraded tourism kind of issue. Um, with these documents, I can now go ahead and, and bid out these things to try and find the best construction. Some of this stuff we can build in house, they'll be, but, but we absolutely have to have the drawings before we can do anything. Uh, we can't just start building buildings or putting engineering projects at this scale into these pits and things like that without somebody with a degree behind their name looking at it, some, it being engineered. Um, this is, we've been talking about this for at least three years now. <laughs> Uh, the barn project specifically will rectify one of the biggest thorns in the city's side in a long, long time uh, in terms of not making us look like ghouls well, the way we're keeping the animals out there while, while preserving that service that we provide. So um, the architect that would be performing the services is really well known to us. He's familiar with our aesthetic. Um, and we've been working with him going on two years to try and refine exactly what we're looking for. So uh, we're at the point now, I mean, you've seen me come in with models of the building and, and all of that other good stuff. We're at the point now where it's a, it's a real thing. It's actually something that we can create now. Um, and we just need the drawings to make that happen. I appreciate that, Wesley. And let me just take a, a moment to say to the public and to others that while we have had the gold museum, the building itself closed to the public for now six or eight weeks, uh, work has continued out there. These guys have been doing a lot of work to prepare for reopening and reopening is coming soon. Uh, I imagine some on the council are thinking we're about to approve spending more money when this thing has been closed, but uh, we've done a lot out there to prepare to reopen uh, with attractions and rebuilds, and I think that uh, we'll all be excited for what actually gets done out there. So with that, Council, any questions? Yeah, how do we choose this, this design out there? The design? The, 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 uh, the, the vendor. The single source here. But we don't have to be a professional service. Yeah. We, yeah. we didn't bid professional services. So, Wesley, okay. um, I'm sorry. No, it, it's okay. Mr. Carter, you, you understand? Okay. Go ahead. Wesley, um, so it says in the your cover sheet here that a copy of the Rickman, the proposal is attached, yeah. but it's not. That didn't make it to the PDF. I was rushing to get it out the door. Yeah. Right. And so the cover sheet itself doesn't also identify the, the projects that you were spelling out. So that right. was kind of the issue. Right. Um, I would like, I would oppose, be opposed to putting it on the consent agenda just because I don't have that material in front okay. of me. Um, so, also, and I understand where you're coming from in your background section there, but it was a little bit, um, the tone was probably a little aggressive, I think, um, for a public document. So I would maybe talk this, maybe we need to tone some of that down a little bit. All right, I'll look at that. Right. I Thank actually you, was going to give you an A for description. You know when they teach children to write in elementary school and everything to use adjectives and be descriptive and uh, there's nothing like the result of chronic vitriolic visitor anger and a <laughs> failure to meet many of the <laughs> and it goes on yeah. I'm telling I, you I was you would have gotten an A <laughs> so. I was just concerned about using language like dangerous uh, morally sustained and so forth in a so public true. document that could come back to uh, hurt the city at some point uh, <laughs> I, I can certainly make those changes. We've been on the, the, the broken end of a bottle with this exhibit yeah. for four years now. And if it weren't here, you would find it on Facebook, let me tell you. This is not even, this is a situation, all joking aside, this is a situation Wesley, I, that. I totally understand, I know, but maybe we're feeding into the fire a little bit when we openly admit that in a public document. That's totally fair. That's and, and I will certainly be mindful of that. Thank so. you, sir. Okay, a point taken. Mr. Young, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned alarming amount of graffiti. Will the professional services also recommend security devices or surveillance or The whatever? actual physical structures themselves will no longer be available without staff present. So um, short of burying it, that'll be the best that you can do. Uh, 
and it, the beauty of that is that once it's a, once we have controlled access, not only do we get to make it a tour item, but it gives some people access to something that they've never had before. So, uh, Wesley, Alyssa, do you have the documents that uh, are the supporting documents here? Does I, she have? I have them? copies. Well, let's hold on. Are you able to get them to Alyssa sometime during this meeting? Probably, yes. Okay. Let me let you do that. Get Let her get it to us, and maybe we'll still consider it for a consent agenda. Maybe we won't. Okay. But, uh, with that, I'm going to move on to... Uh, Can I mention one other Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Because um, that one was just a comment. I did, and maybe the supporting documents will do this, so tell me. I still was unclear about what we were designing. Right. The three yeah. projects. I know we've talked about there's dangerous entryways. We need to secure them. So is that, that what those is, documents will show? That is what show? those documents I'll wait for that. are okay. intended to show. Okay, okay, so let's do that. Let's, any other questions on this item before I move? Because we're going to come back to this one before we close. All right, uh, let's go to number two, web design and services. Wesley, go ahead. All right, so as we stand right now, we are kind of piggybacked on the city website. And the, the, the biggest problem with that is that our operation out there is very unique in terms of the way we interact with the public via the website. And we don't have any efficient way of selling tickets, of making reservations, any of that. And so we need to have a website put together that allows us to do the work that, that is not – it's not capable – we're not capable of doing it through the, the regular city website at this time. Um, we're we're getting close to when we think about Ghost Train and Winter Wonderland again. And Wes, can you get a little closer to the mic? Sorry, we're getting probably this is not helping either. That's true, but yeah, um, we're getting closer to our big events, and we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars worth of tickets that we have to process by hand, and it's creating or it has created historically kind of an issue of almost antagonizing some of the customers that want to quickly purchase their tickets and, and move on. And so we just need to come into the 21st century in terms of being able to give our information to people, to, to talk to the public, but also to have them interact with us. Um, hopefully we'll be able to also put all of our stock on there. And so in times like this where we are shut down, we can continue sales and reservations and everything else. We just need the platform to do it. And the, the website as it stands is just simply not capable of supporting it. So we have, we actually talked to three different companies. Uh, one bid was very, very, very low, but I do not believe in all honesty that I can recommend them based upon what they can provide for us, even though they are acknowledged. I mean, I acknowledge that they're the lowest bidder. Uh, the middle one, the Lime Biscuit, uh, the, the actual proposal that they gave to me was almost a carbon copy of the notes that I had written for myself as to what we were looking for and what we needed for the website itself. Um, and then the third one was preposterously expensive and it, it, it would have set the city up where they were paying for monthly services just All right, let, to the let end me interrupt. Of time. So um, and, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I want to see those bids in this in this packet right. as well. Okay, yeah. it's not helpful if I can't look at this even while you're talking to me. Right. So I, I, you don't do a lot of presenting, so please, you know, I don't I don't mean in any disrespect, but I can't move on with this item until I see those either. Now I don't question the need for a a standalone web service for being able to advance purchase tickets for scheduling and that kind of thing. I'm you're going to find me supportive. But I've got to see all the documents, right. and I know these folks want to see it as well. So let's, we're, can you get that also before, I can. That's, and that's, before the end of this I, meeting? I apologize for that. That's simply a product of me rushing to get that PDF out the door. It is exactly what that is. Well, we don't want to be guilty of rushing to approve right. it without having the right. information. Mayor, so, may I ask a yes, question sir, there? Go ahead. Does this not fall underneath the professional services exception, though? Well, even if it does, I still want to see right. what these he, – he just described three different bid processes, right. and I yeah. want to see how that was laid out. Well, I, and, I, and I was just going to say – I was going to say that as well, but, but again, your description here cites that they're attached and they're not. So right. I was going to let this one slide just because it was professional services, and it described what you were doing and what right. was going on, whereas your previous one didn't. But it, it, 
I don't disagree with the mayor at the end of the day. So. Is, uh, <laughs> let me ask you this. If I open this other one, am I going to have the same problem with You're this POS? Then, then let's not even talk about yeah. that one. Let me let you go sit down and get that information to the clerk and let her get it loaded up for us, and we, we'll go back and we'll come back to this, okay? Okay. Thank you, Wesley. Yep, thank you. Sorry All right, about let's that. move on to D, Human Services, uh, Stephanie Rooks. Uh, D1, Change in Payroll Provider. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, today I want to present with you a proposal to change our payroll provider. Um, Right now we are paying over $55,000 a year for applicant tracking, performance management, and um, learning management with Thread and NeoGov. What I'd like to do is change to a one provider that encompasses all of those programs. Um, we have, we being myself, Shannon, and Sarah, have been into three in-depth demonstrations of three different companies. That would be Paycom, Paylocity, and NeoGov. NeoGov is very cumbersome, hard to maneuver in the system, and is not very customer friendly to the employees. As a matter of fact, NeoGov doesn't even pay their own people through their system. They pay it through a different system. So, um, uh, let's see, Paycom is the one we are recommending. It is not the lowest bidder, but I believe it is the most um, user friendly. You can get anywhere within the system in three clicks, which is a big deal for our, our uh, generation now. They have direct um, access to their own information, so they can change their address, they can change their taxes, they can change um, whatever they need to change and keep it up to date with it actually flowing into everything else without approvals from from us. They also have enhanced workflow that encompasses, you can um, request leave time off, you can request a change to your time card, you can, and the manager can initiate personnel actions, all that would flow through a workflow approval process electronically. Um, let's see. We have control over our GL mapping going from Paycom into our GL for payroll pro information. That way Sarah would not have to contact Paycom to get approval and have them map it. She could do it herself. Okay. There is Go ahead. There's an app that Paycom you can download from the app store that the employees can do everything from their phones. Um, they can clock in from their phones, but we can actually limit where they can clock in from through geo mapping. So if they're not in the Avanti building, they can't clock in, something like that. So, and there would be no more lines at that time clock within the Avanti building at 7 o'clock in the morning. So um, implementation takes six to eight weeks. If approved, we'd like to um, implement this with a first check date of October 1st to in line with the um, fiscal year. So if I read this correctly, uh, by using multiple systems now, we're spending about $55,183. Yes. If we go to this new system, not only is it, the, do they work together, is it all, it doesn't it's require multiple database. systems, it's yes. a single system. Yes. And we actually are going to spend $2,000 less. The first year. And then? Then it'll go down to $48,000 a year from 57. So then we save even more money after that. Correct. Okay. Uh, council, any, any questions? Yeah, I have a concern, and I want you to stop me and correct me if I read this wrong. Okay. Um, because the title looks misleading to me because it says change a payroll provider and correct me on this part, when it says it also has to do with the management training, oh, where's that sentence? Um, which led me to believe, because I thought we used NeoGov, was having to do with the evaluations and everything else. So if we're switching all that too. Yes, we are. Okay, so here's my concern. Last year when we talked about how important it was to have good evaluations and I get the training tracking. That's where it'll automatically come up for you. Somebody's due for training. It's not like, oh, gee, we totally forgot. So it's got all that. My concern is this. 
we had talked about the importance of that evaluation process. We wanted something we liked. We looked at it last time. Here, it's packaged in with something called changing the payroll provider, and we're doing more than changing the payroll provider. We're that changing our pro process provider, which Paycom is one database that includes the performance management and the learning management. Okay. Okay. So really it is, it's all encompassing, but primarily they're a payroll provider, okay. but they have all these things. So in since it. it's all encompassing, do we care about looking at what they use in that segment of evaluation, employee evaluation and that sort of thing, or do do we care about seeing it? We saw it last time before we adopted it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that is a, a, a good question. So we're going to actually have a new system. It, it'll all be in, in one single source, but that's where the evaluations will be kept. Yes. So the ones that we looked at last year, uh, when I asked you to send me, set me up for the right. ones that I looked at, that one's going away? Yes. So we never actually adopted that, though, right? Did we didn't adopt a performance, a merit system, okay? We approved the purchase of the management system, but we have never adopted a merit-based increase system. And that's what the main concern was last year, was we needed a merit-based. Well, there was that, but we also wanted to see performance evaluations if we wanted to see them, and we wanted to know that they were being done. They are being done. Um, I mean, I can tell you that. But again, this system is very, very cumbersome. So with that and system, did it have an ongoing cost? The, yes. Oh, yes. And <laughs> so did you include that as part of the, this the cost savings, yes. comparison? You did. Mm -hmm. And how much did we spend for that last year? We spent 24000 last year because of the implementation costs. This year it would have been for the learning and the performance would have been $18,000. So we cannot approve this with the implement, implementation cost and then go back to another system next year or the next year. No, or the I'm next not. Year. I've got to know that this is the system going forward. This is the system that we believe will be the most user-friendly and productive system. Because we have in some ways we threw away $24,000. No, because we did use it. Well, we did two use systems. it, but now we're going to have to learn a new system. Correct. Okay. All right. I understand that, and I have some of the same objections, but I think we are moving to a streamlined system, so it, it's something that I can support. Any other council members have any questions? No? Okay. That being the case, um, are there any objections to placing it on the consent agenda? Just that I I'd kind of like to see that. I'd like to see the system we saw the last do you one. have some sort of a demo that you could send to us I or to any contact, screenshots I have or to contact our provider at pay our contact at paycom to set up okay. a demo a, a list of what did you use and the dates the dates that they were added to the system pardon a list of training subjects and the dates they were added to the system so that we can make sure they're current the just the, like the, the course catalog the last one yeah mm -hmm. it's a learning system so I, you know right uh, what data did you did you have a uh, demo? I had you, yes. Okay, so you you've actually participated in the demo, so you understand what we're looking at. Um, yeah, I don't want to be a pain in the neck. I just knew the last time we actually looked at it before we said, yeah, let's do this. I am totally sold on the idea. If it's user friendly, it'll work for better for the employees. We don't want. It's cheap. I'm not in lines. We're saving money. I mean, there's a whole let lot me, of things. Let to me feel see if anybody about. has any objection to this. We will place it on the consent agenda and we'll move forward, but you have to schedule a demo for us to at least familiarize ourselves with it in the next 60 or 90 days. Okay. Is that, does anybody object to that? The only issue with that is if we sign a contract and we're not happy with it. I mean, then. Well, I can't imagine that we're not going to be happy with it. I don't think that's what it was. I think it's about understanding how it works. Pretty much. And because our HR director has already looked at how it works for her. And you feel good the about the evaluation right. system, yes. the way it's set up and everything, and what they look at? I do. And then we can also have them tailor it to us if we want anything changed. Okay. Okay. W was PACOM considered last year? No. Hmm. 
any particular reason why not? Or they just they weren't played. They, okay. I didn't. I don't think we considered anybody else last year other than NeoGov. And come to find out, most of these payroll companies do have an integrated performance and learning piece in them. Okay. So is there is there any other questions? I, I think I'd like to see the documentation before we put the demo. Up. Well, well, not necessarily a demo, but there was a lot of documentation with with the NeoGov system that was put out in a, in a way of the, you know either documents or PDFs or something. Talk, you know. I have a offer? business proposal that. I was it saying talks about a, a, you, the, normally when there's a system involved, they've got advertisement that shows it in wonderful light and color and stuff like that. <laughs> that you just forward the PDF. Okay, we're not going to put this on the consent agenda. Can you provide some documentation before Tuesday, or do I need to take this off of the agenda? I'll do my best to get it by Tuesday. All right, then we'll leave it here uh, and we'll bring it up Tuesday and see where we're at. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next uh, up is going to be Jim Chambers, uh, E1 Grad at Communications video stream. And let me just make a note. Uh, Jim had asked me earlier in the week, or maybe last week, if we were going to do both uh, work sessions and uh, regular meetings for uh, the, uh, with Grad at Communications. And I, I, I thought I conveyed that we would that I would talk to Tom and get back to him, but I think I said we might only do the council meetings and Jim only set the council meeting for Tuesday with Gratic. That's why they're not here tonight, but Jim's going to talk to us tonight about what the, the contract would look like, the agreement with Gratic, and we can decide from there whether we will do uh, work sessions and uh, council meetings with Gratic, which would be two different setups, two different fees, uh, and I'm doing part of your job, but just you'll have it. <laughs> or whether or not uh, we will uh, just do one and only have one fee. The thing is, if we end up, like before, when we were doing one meeting, uh, or same day work session and meeting, we only had to pay one time. And if we roll back to that, say, after December, uh, we would be back to paying for one time. But Jim, go ahead. I'm sorry to do part of that. OK, before you go. Yes, sir, go ahead. Is this tonight's meeting, or is this work session day of spring now? It's being streamed, but it's not being streamed by Gratic. It's oh, being okay. streamed under the other, the, under old, the system. old system. Yes, sir. Okay. But it is being streamed. May I have a point of yes, order? Yes, ma'am. It's hard to hear Michael sometime, and I'm sitting here, so I'm not sure how it is out there. But I know there's people out there they can't hear Danny, so I don't know if there's an <laughs> adjustment. How about this? Please well, don't do that. That's a little too close, but you can hear it. Are you good, Michael? Say something. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. I All think right. Maybe you're too I don't know. Maybe you're too far from the mic. Don't, don't put it too close to your mouth. They won't be able to hear, especially on the And we've had scheduling problems with people that are reprogramming the system. They've installed all the new equipment, but it hasn't been fully reprogrammed and calibrated yet. So hopefully that will happen either next week or week after. Okay. Thank you for that. Go ahead. Um, like, like the mayor was saying, uh, this is for uh, basically $750 per, per stream. Uh, each time they come out and set up their equipment, 750 bucks. So whether it's a work session and a council session following right after, that's 750. That's two separate meetings. It's 750 a pop. Um, on the on the lighter side, um, Elise and I've been working together on ESC networks on a way to eliminate that cost, which is about 350 a month. Um, probably going to move catalog and archiving all of our videos straight to YouTube, and then probably start streaming hopefully straight to Facebook. And, and that way it'll be a little bit more user friendly than what we have right now. Eliminate some of the costs. Make this a a little bit easier pill to swallow. Okay, so go ahead with what uh, you're you're asking the council to look at tonight. Um, recommend we move to Gratic Communications for streaming our meetings. As y'all saw, is a much more professional uh, presentation. Um, something that we couldn't duplicate on our own. Uh, my AV knowledge is about as much as y'all's is with a home entertainment system. Um, you know, I've I've learned a lot with doing this system and a few other systems like this, but. Uh, as far as what they do is, and the presentation that they provide is, is way beyond a, a scope that I could provide for us. Um, it's just like, just like a regular TV service, it really is. I mean, top-notch job, can't say enough about them. Um, but it is, it is a price that we're not paying right now, so. What are oh. we paying right now? 350 a month to ESC Networks to, st that. to stream, but we can go to YouTube for no cost. Or Facebook. 
Jim. and streamed live to Facebook, correct? Jim, so what would happen to the Villarica.tv website and the archives of the videos there? We still own that domain, so we could sit there and point that to our Facebook page and to our archive page, okay. which would be YouTube. And so the so grad, when grad streams, they will stream to, I mean, where would the public access their stream? Through Facebook? They could be notified through Facebook, or they would know to go to Villarica.tv the way they always have. We, we, we okay. have a schedule. So that won't change then? Okay. Unless we wanted it to. Okay. And then, I mean, would we then archive, like, let's say, for example, we stream next Tuesday's meeting, and then Upload is it, where's it, it going to be? It'll stay mm -hmm. on? Okay. It will be archived. Mm -hmm. So future meetings will be archived on YouTube as well. And we could stream live with YouTube as well, um, or just, you know, whenever the video uploads to YouTube, if somebody didn't catch it live, if, you know, if they, say, subscribe to us on YouTube and had the little bell notification, mm -hmm. they would get a notification that, hey, there's new content available for them to view, and they would go out and see it that way. It would right. actually be easier for us to reach the people uh, through YouTube and Facebook. Right. I, I, I've, been, I've been, for a couple of years now, I've been saying that we should move away from the uh, bird's eye view camera system that we had. So I'm totally generally for this, and I would like to see it on YouTube and Facebook or, or Facebook, one of the two. I guess my only question then is, um, is there a way to structure around the 750? For example, if we go back to the two, uh, the work session meeting at five and then the council meeting at six, that you're saying that'll count as two meetings, so that's seven, no, no that, that will not. One. Okay, all I right, mean, thank you, that, that makes sense. Their, their cost is kind of like a, you know, you, you hire a landscaper to come out, if they, if they take the equipment yeah. off the truck, that's a charge. Once they mobilize, Correct. They, they charge. Okay. Um, and then the only other question is, though, if we just stream directly to YouTube ourselves and did this in-house, just set up a camera in the back, or I think that's how, it looks like that's how Carroll County does it with their feed. I mean, what's the comparative? We don't get the production. We don't get the little, you know, you're not going to have my name and when I'm speaking Correct. and so forth. But uh, it, what means there value in considering that as well? I, th I think either way we're going to get away from ESC networks. We're going to. I don't disagree that with that, but I guess my is there an alternative Gradic that might? We could I, upgrade I mean, I the cameras. I love Gradic, but is there an alternative that we I? We could upgrade think the cameras of? and try and beautify it as as much as possible. I mean, if possible. we just put a what is it called a PTV camera in the back, or, mm -hmm. or and then have I don't know an intern or something just hit Zoom or something. I don't know, but <laughs> I'm just saying, what's the alternative? So those are my thoughts. And I like uh, the quality of Gradic, but I am concerned about paying for two different meetings. I want to look at what our options are there because right now that's what we are. We're Thursday and we're Tuesday. Um, it's okay with me if we don't have the close-ups. That's, that's, you can skip those. <laughs> they zoom right, but that's okay. I think from the feedback that I got that you're paying $400 more a month to, to keep the public informed and, and let them watch something that's, that they can actually hear and see is worth it. Well, the yeah. point... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's 750 per meeting. So, you know, I'm not a math major, but 15, that's $1,500 a month. Even if we went back to the two meetings a month and we did the counts, the work sessions prior to, that's $1,500. So either way, we're paying $1,500 a month. Am I not, am I not right? right? If you have the meetings, uh, both meetings on the same day, you pay one seven hundred and fifty dollar charge. Right, but if we have, what if we have two? If we go back to the t second Tuesday and fourth Tuesday or third? Oh well, if we ended up going back to two regular right, exactly. meetings, that Tenure hasn't even up. been discussed. But so you're right; that would need to be considered. Right. If we got to that place, that's not right. where we're at. Uh, I don't mind like doing this for the rest of the year and just I don't know. Let, let me say this: um, the quality that we got from Gradic was hands down better than anything that we have ever had here. For sure. Jim has explained to me that we cannot duplicate that even. Uh, so he has said to me that even if we buy the equipment, we don't have the trained personnel to be able to do it. There's not an intern who's willing to come down here and do that that we can rely on. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The public did reach out to me uh, to discuss the, the, the Gradic uh, quality and it was overwhelmingly one-sided. They believed that, that that served a purpose. I have never believed that we should do anything uh, half. I believe that if we're going to do it, we should do it right. Uh, the system we had before, you just may as well not even watch it because you could not get through 
uh, a full meeting without a ton of cutoffs and interruptions and I can't hear and no video and it, it's just a mess. It, it, it makes no sense to even have it if you can't have a quality uh, system that you can count on. They're seeing that tonight. I guarantee you what's going on right now. They're getting choppy, choppy words and a blurred vision. I, I think that we may end up, I, I certainly feel like I may be in favor of us going back to a same day work session and meeting. Uh, but right now we have to decide what we're going to do for the rest of the year. And we know what the schedule is going to be. We're not deciding that. We need to decide if we're going to do Gratic. And if we are, are we going to have Gratic for both the work session and the regular meeting? Or are we just going to have them for the regular meeting? And my guess is that doesn't work either because the work sessions is where all the, the discussion goes on. And so if you're going to deprive the public of the work session, you may as well not do it, uh, is my opinion. So uh, that, that being said, uh, does council have any questions or input? I, for one, don't believe that we necessarily are going back to the two council meeting thing because we have some items right now that we have um, had to put aside and wait for that to be corrected before we can move on with those items. And we would not be able to go to the council meeting in an hour from now and settle those items. We would have to put them off. So we can get well, them settled before the Right, meeting. we're not going to discuss the schedule yet, So, but I understand your point. Anybody else? Okay, so let's look at what is it that you're that you have outlined here make the motion to utilize graphic communications for streaming our meetings going forward for the cost of 750 per session so I think that what we want to decide here is will we use them for both sessions each month or one uh, or at all does anybody have any input on that I would say you have to do both sessions I it's agree. hard to imagine that you can't we have to record both and there's no way of half doing it one way or another way is there there may be, oh, what do you mean, half like doing tonight over our system and Tuesday over their system? Yeah, what I don't other agree with that. option is there because it's not open and I have a real problem, again, if it's not open and transparent government. And if it's like, oh, there was no volume on that video, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a problem, you know. This also gives us redundancy because we will still use the yeah. old system as well just to have another another recording just in case well and you don't note it here but uh, Steve Graddick told me that in addition to the service they provide here they will also provide us with a full DVD of it for our hard records so that is another plus here mm -hmm. so I think that uh, I think that we don't have to modify this my my position would be to put this on the consent agenda and that Jim would make the arrangements for the work session and the regular meeting and if we call special call meetings then Jim would need to to arrange that with Gratic and we'll do this for the rest of the year agree I agree as well all right then I'm going to place this on the consent agenda with those directions if there are no objections I'm okay no well, objections. Well, well if you change the motion well that's just guidance for Jim the motion is still for okay. for per session is Jim just has to make internal decisions as a session. department head about the sessions Correct. all right Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Barber, you've been quiet mostly, and now you will have center stage. Professional services agreement for gold dust splash pad. Go ahead. All right, when I was in Fairburn, we had an old indoor swimming pool that we didn't know what to do with that we inherited when we bought a park. And we wanted to renovate it and I wasn't comfortable doing it. I knew I didn't know what I was doing. I had never built a pool indoors, outdoors, renovated a pool indoors or outdoors. And after about three years or four years, I met Bob McAllister by accident. I took some folks on a tour like we've done when we went, you know, to the visit the downtowns. I went to Cobb County to one of their indoor facilities and met Bob. He was there, the Cobb County Aquatics Director. I think he ran about seven facilities. And he had been there so long and had that place in such good shape that they had not only 
built or modified their facilities, but actually had built a water park in South Cobb. And he had gotten to the point where Cobb County had authorized him to, cons or allowed him to consult on the side. So he was already working with cities and counties while he was a full-time employee of Cobb County. And so he came in and helped me in Fairburn and we took that old pool and converted it into an outdoor pool and built a splash pad and slides and a great big locker room building. It's gorgeous. And um, I got to watch that whole process. So from the conceptual design through the the architectural work, the engineering, the bid, the selection, the construction, I got to see the whole thing. It's one of the last things I got to do. So we opened it up on um, Memorial Day weekend of 16 and my last day was June something in 16. So I think I got to see it operate for about three weeks. I am totally sold on this guy. He has since retired, so he's doing consulting now with cities and counties only. He knows as much about this stuff as most anybody I've met who knows about what they do. The operational part, the employment part, the maintenance part, the construction part, vendors, I mean, you know, the whole shebang. So. My recommendation, since I still, even though I built one splash pad, I know I still don't know anything about building splash pads relative to him, that we engage him and what he would do is come in here and walk us through the conceptual design and then help us through the whole rest of the process, the RFP, the selection of the vendors, the actual architecture, design, the engineering, the whole shebang all the way through construction. And I think if we do that, we'll know on the front end how big a bite we can take you know how big and nice of a park can, or splash pad can we build we'll know that on the front and when we get to the end of this it'll be it'll be what we expected now it may not be what y'all all have in mind because you may have in mind a two hundred thousand dollar water a splash pad and we may have the money for a hundred but we'll know going into this, you know, what a hundred will give us, and we may be able to look at that point and go, well, you know, a hundred really isn't what we want. We really want a hundred and twenty-five splash pad, or or not. I mean, you know. But I believe in this guy, and I believe in this process because I've watched it. And for a group of people like us who know that we don't know anything about this, this is the only way to go. Unless some of y'all know something about splash pads that I'm not aware of not me uh, anybody have any questions I know that our uh, now private citizen recreation expert living here in Villarica weighed in on this and Jeff Reese says Bob McAllister is the guy to go to anybody um, else yeah mine is more in the form of a comment there might have been a time where I would have said why do we have to pay this guy to do this stuff but then <laughs> I experienced life these last years and said, and I remember we had a conversation because previously when we looked at splash pads years ago, Janet Hyde had been here the first time before she came back second time. And I remember being on vacation going down the Florida Turnpike or something, and I'm reading all these other cities' reviews on what they had done, what they had put on, what the pitfalls. And it's, I mean, it's really good because you, they've already done it, and they'll go, well, this was a problem, or we would do it different, you know. And so I took in that information. I'm not sure why because now we have this guy, or, or will potentially have this guy. But I remember asking you one time, how do governments keep, from getting taken for a ride by bills because we've seen it not only what what we dealt with with our library when even we had staff that didn't even engage at meetings much less have somebody to oversee what was doing now we have a courthouse in Carroll County that's falling apart that is not that old and I'm like how does this happen well because apparently there's nobody there on our side to watch out for our project and these things happen so this doesn't 
look like a lot of money. And you told me then, though, you said, it's expensive, but that's how you have somebody watching out for your project. But in this case, he's not even expensive, I wouldn't say. I, I realize we're not doing a multi-million dollar project here. Okay. Not yet. Any other questions? That's a, that's a, uh, those are excellent points because I, oftentimes I hear people in the public say, why do you have to have an engineer or why do you have to do all this preliminary work? Why do you need a consultant? Well, that's the, that's the reason you hire a lawyer because he knows things about what it's going to be like when you get in the situation that you just think you know before you get there. All right, if there are no objections, I'll place this on the consent agenda. Agreed. No objection. Agreed. All right, Tom, let's go to uh, work order with Brennan Jones to evaluate the sewer system along Anderson Road and the Cleghorn lift station. All right, we're working with Arbor Valley, um, whatever their name is, Arbor Valley something from Birmingham, for the apartment complex on Anderson Road in front of the lift station. We have worked through the land swap. We are through the negotiation of the MOU. Part of what that MOU details is their responsibility for water improvements and road improvements and that kind of thing. But because the lift station is adjacent to their property, they don't have any responsibility for sewer improvements, right? They just got to hook into the lift station and they're done. Well, I, I started looking at some stuff that Pete had given me and lo and behold, in the property that we took in the swap, there's a creek on the east side and there's a sewer line on both sides of it. And that, I, I did that face right there. And so I called Brennan and I said, what in the world is this? And so one of the, one of the things that a sewer line does one sewer line is it gives you the ability to develop. What a second line does is it takes away land to develop on, right? Because you have this big sewer easement, you can't build on it. So I would like for him to come in and explain to me what in the world have we done out there and why are there two duplicate, apparently duplicate lines on either side of this creek and can we get rid of one and which and how and then I also want him to look at the Cleghorn station to make sure that in light of what we what is now our latest thought about that whole tad area that we have the pump capacity that we need and if not that we start working toward that so my recommendation is we approve that we authorize um, this work order for 18850 for him to do the survey work, he'll outsource that and then to do his part. Okay. Are there any questions from council? The 18850, where'd that come from? Negotiated price between y'all? It's it's three pieces. There's a, a survey piece and then there's a review of these duplicate lines and how we get rid of that. And then there's an, a third piece which will be the review of the Cleghorn. So he's estimated giving us a not to exceed for each of the three. So he'll outsource the survey work and manage that, and then he'll do the other two himself. So this is a work order sitting on top of the service agreement that we signed with him maybe in 18, does that sound right? So we have an agreement with him and we're just attaching work orders to it now as we go. In fact, we've got another one coming up after this. Right. So okay. you're really surprised you found something you didn't know about. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the combination of not knowing about it, and then when you know about it, you scratch your head and you can't figure out the why. So now he's sitting in my old seat. That's the stuff I used to say. And now yeah, I save my oxygen. It's frustrating. Okay. Any, any other questions? No. All right. Uh, if there are no objections, I'll place this item on the consent agenda. No objection. We will move on to work order with Brennan Jones for Nally Road Sewer Review. All right. So every time that we have a the opportunity because of a new development, we are 
trying to offload as much infrastructure improvement onto the developer as we can. Even when we can't do that, we are basically, on, at least on the sewer side, requiring the developer to work with Brennan as they design the sewer component of their project. In this case, if you're familiar with the Nally Road property, this is east of Nally Road. So this is the very eastern side of the city limits below Connor, Connor's Road. And in order for them to provide sewer there, they're probably the best, the best thing for us is for them to build a lift station, which should not come out of my mouth ever, right? Because we need another lift station like we need a hole in our head. But in this case, I believe that we can have them build a new lift station and enable us to mothball a lift station. And not only that, but avoid upgrading that lift station because right now we already know that we need to upgrade it. So we're not only going to have them build a new one, but we're going to get rid of the upgrade responsibility for an old one, existing one. So $4,500 for Brennan to figure all that out. Um, every time we touch this stuff now, we are, we're doing two sort of philosophy things. We're trying to move from lift stations to gravity where it makes economic sense, right? We just want it to just flow downhill instead of having to pump it. And we're trying to move stuff off to the developer, right? So every time we touch this stuff now, we're trying to do that. And this is, this is an instance where we may get to do that. Well, this is certainly a worthwhile project. This isn't one that's going to require a lot of discussion. Uh, anybody have any questions? My only question is actually on the development project. Is that something that's going to come before zoning or is it already zoned? Well, I mean, everything's zoned. The question is... Right, well, well I mean, all, for what, it, their, for what their proposal it's is. It's a PUD. It's already in a PUD. It's already zoned for right? Okay. Yeah. There's a new pod. Okay, so we're hoping that you guys get to touch that. Okay. It'll go P and Z or not? Concept on the pod. Yeah, P and Z. Okay. So, so John would have it. Y'all would have it. Conceptual, you know, all the way through. And is that process what allows us to negotiate with them to uh, take on some of this construction cost? Well, they well they're going to have to construct something. For sewer, you know, we're just going to try to direct them to what would be best for that region as opposed to just what's best for them because right. the thing that has bitten us over the years is allowing the, built, the developer of a neighborhood to do just what was best for the neighborhood, which is just best for the developer. That's Bay Springs, Twin Oaks. Augusta Woods, Summergate, you know, that whole thing right My there was a series Thanks. of what's best for the developer. So we're trying to avoid that. I like that comment down there. I'll let that go. Okay, if there are no more questions and no objections, I'll place this on the consent agenda. Agreed. No okay. objection. All right, last item uh, for you is going to be professional services with Falcon Design Consultants for Oversight of Construction Projects. Go ahead. All right. So y'all did not hear this really clearly, but Bobby and Pete are not happy with what necessarily we did tonight. We recommended to you three times the low bidder and basically because I made them. It's too low. Right? I mean, y'all saw it. It in was one too case, low, yes. and, but we checked, you know, like, Carol, how many feet did they do for Carol? 34,000 feet or something? I mean, they've done miles and miles and miles of pipe for Matt, and Matt's totally happy with them. But they've done some work other places that wasn't as happy with them. So, 
my thought is if we have this big spread between the first and second vendor in all three cases, we can afford to invest some money in a really technical oversight. This even costs us a chunk of money to make sure that what we get at the end of this isn't just cheap. Because we know we're going to get cheap. I mean, it's slow bid by a bunch on all three of these. So I want to bring Skip in here, and I and I want to do that with y'all knowing up front, because y'all had, you know, y'all had some experience with Skip before I got here that wasn't great. We have a little history. You do, yeah. but I, but this is sort of like dealing with Bob again. I used Skip on multiple projects in in Fairburn, and he and I worked great together, and he he saved my behind because he was managing construction. We built a classroom building, we built a stage and courtyard. Um, and then we did the aquatics thing. I had no, you know, I'm not a construction guy, and I know that. And he is, and when he's plugged in the right way, and he's representing us, he is a bulldog. You you got to see it on the other side, because he felt like the city was not treating the vendor fairly because of the relationship and the direction they'd been given. The council had expectations and the vendor was directed and they didn't jive and y'all couldn't figure out, you know. I think it was a misunderstanding is what it was. People thought, had expectations for yes. something that the vendor, to the best of our knowledge, had not agreed to and there was a mix in there that we don't need to talk about right. in a public meeting well, here. But there was well, a lack that, of communication. You know, we're really aware of that in, in this new paving contract that Bobby's working on yeah but it makes it expensive you know we spent spent what a million how much we spend that first contract a million bucks or 900 or yeah well I mean we spent a million dollars with see that with uh, CW CW Matthews because we did it right the second time well there right? I mean that you just answered we're the question. given LCS 793 thousand dollars we need to protect that to make sure that it's spent well <clears throat> right. because i'm telling you that 50 years from now if we do that 12 inch line right there's a chance that 12 inch could still work right ductile iron pipe 50 years from now if it's installed right yeah, Tom, but only if it's installed right i mean you've mentioned multiple times tonight things that have bite bitten us and i do agree that not having proper oversight on some projects has absolutely bit in the city and you know one of the questions is why do we have two uh, parallel sewer lines yep. and one parcel but so I agree with that I guess my only concern is you know did we hire someone in the past to pr provide oversight and how do we do who's overseeing the oversight but I guess that's a domino effect thing um, but we Apparently, there's a history we trust this uh, Falcon design. Yeah, if we don't hire a good inspector, then same on us. I mean, that's, well, you know, there, that's our job. Let me say this. There, there is a, a good rationale for doing this, especially with us going with these low bids. And, I, and you and I have discussed this outside of this room. What, what I might like to see, and I don't know if you're capable of doing this tonight, if, if you're even capable of doing it some other day, is having a not to exceed number of hours on this this project you simply have hundred twenty dollars I can do hour. that to him I, I just feel like I don't know he is going to provide us with a service that is that is valuable uh, while we accept these low bids but at the same time there ought to be some idea of how much we're going to spend for a guy to oversee uh, the project. So I, I give you, I give you a for instance of experience that I had to tell you why you should. Your concern is valid. We did a four million dollar road improvement when I was in Fairburn through the South Fulton CID, and I hired an inspector through an engineer. So I was paying, you know, a lot per hour plus the guy's markup and all that. And we did a four million dollar road project, and I spent two hundred grand on inspection. Hmm. 
again, I'm going to need a right. not to exceed. To, to, to support your point, right? I mean, it, that, it is a legitimate concern, but at the end of that project, I could have written a, a chapter of a book about all the things that that vendor tried to do to us that we stopped where they were just shaving costs or or when it was raining they would try to do things when the ground wasn't suitable because it saved them schedule time right which mm -hmm. is you may not think of that in terms of saving money but i mean that's you know from the contractor's perspective that's what they were doing and we stopped them because you know so was it worth it in the moment no right it cost me four million two to do a four million dollar job but my old story you know 20 years from now that that'll be a jam up road still i just want to know so. that for those 120 an hour they're be accounting to you they're reporting to you that yeah. you're overseeing them as they're saying this and is what I was doing. And Pete. Okay. What do you got, Pete? What, what I was going to say is that the timeline for the two projects, the uh, Highway 78 project was uh, 45 days to completion on that, and 120 days for the Edge Road project for substantial completion. And if there's a punch list of, of miscellaneous stuff, the, fi the final payoff would be 150 day time frame. So if that gives you some timeline of how long we would need someone. 60 days on Bobby's. And 60 days on Bobby's project. Okay. Uh, do you feel like you need any guidance on that or can you do what Councilwoman McPherson is suggesting that as long as they are reporting to you then you can manage to all of us. I yeah, mean, well, the, the three of us. Yeah. But you can manage that cost per yeah. hour. Okay. Well, all right. Well, not the cost per hour. Well, I understand. I the, 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 the number of hours the at one twenty right. at one hundred twenty dollars an hour. Are yeah. there any other, Mr. Montahan? Okay. Uh, if there are no objections, I'll place this on the consent agenda. Agreed. Okay. No objection. Uh, thank you, Tom. Next up is going to be. Well, give me just a minute. Is have you not yet? Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and go to community development. Uh, Chris Montesinos, uh, adoption of the Villarica zoning ordinance and official zoning map. So let me preface this. Uh, tonight you'll notice we don't have any city attorney here. I thought we would have a fill-in uh, for Mr. Macklin. He is not here. So I'm not sure how much, <laughs> I'm not sure how much uh, we're going to get through. But what we're going to do is uh, Chris is going to present this tonight. We will try to uh, get as many uh, questions answered as we can, but if they become a legal question, the city attorney represents the city in legal matters, and that's who we will defer to. Uh, with that, Mr. Montesinos, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor and City Council. Uh, what I would like to take this opportunity to present to you where we are with respect to the status of objections and appeals. Um, as you're aware, we've uh, been going at this for, uh, what, a year and a half, I'll, I think we're out, um, and we've got to the part where we've written the ordinance, and we had to actually apply that to the map, and as that was applied, we had to come up with an appeals process for property owners that did not um, agree with the city's decision on how the, their property should be zoned. Uh, let me just run through some stats for the uh, for the public's benefit. Um, starting from the beginning, uh, we received uh, 96. Well, excuse me, 96 properties were identified in the citywide rezoning as being a substantive change from the current zoning. In other words, if they were going from an industrial to <coughs> an agricultural, or from a commercial to a residential, or um, uh, you know, there's a significant change in use or the intensity of that use. We identified that as being a substantial change in the zoning. Uh, we began with 96 properties and sent out uh, 76 certified notices of intent to rezone. Now, the reason there are 70, 96 
properties in 76 letters that went out is because there were numerous uh, property owners that had multiple properties and they were sent out in the same letter. So uh, of those 76, uh, 65 were marked as received or return receipt from the post office. Uh, 10 letters came back as undelivered. Of those 10, uh, rep 10 letters representing 12 properties. Uh, one of those was actually in a, an appeal later. Uh, so the property was uh, lumped together with some other ones off of uh, 61 that uh, it just happened to uh, abut. Uh, there were two up zones. Uh, there were two lateral zones. Uh, there were three corrections where the zoning did not match what was actually developed on the ground, and there were four, four down zones uh, coinciding with that. And in going and looking at those particular uh, ones that we received, uh, there's not a one in there that I would say there was that there was any question whatsoever. Of, or, excuse me, whatsoever about how they should be intended to be zoned. For example, uh, there are some properties off of uh, Old Town Road. Uh, there's a, a, a small street called Reed Street, and it's got about five houses on it. Uh, for some reason, those are all zoned light industrial. Uh, there's, we're not depriving anyone of anything if we change those to single family residential. So we're not, we're, we're not doing anything that uh, <clears throat> is going to affect how things are currently developed, how they're currently used. And in fact, the appeals that we are going through I would say 90% of them are for undeveloped property, but I'll get to that next. Um, so as of uh, currently, we were contacted by 27 individuals representing 41 properties who had an issue with how the city was proceeding with the zoning. Uh, 10 people in addition to that, well actually, so, so, let me back up a minute. 10 people who were of those 27 actually expressed uh, that they didn't have an issue with what, how the city was uh, moving forward. So that leaves us with 17 property owners representing 27 properties. Uh, we were able to make administrative adjustments to three, four, four, three of those property owners representing five properties. So that's a net result and we've got 14 property owners that we were that we sent the zoning appeals packets to uh, So that's just to kind of backtrack out of 96 properties that we're Experiencing a substantial change in zoning. We have 14 property owners representing 20 uh, representing uh, I'm sorry 25 properties that actually had or uh, expressed a desire to appeal the zoning uh, zoning change. Now, since then, uh, of those 17 that were sent out, we received 17 return receipts. So we had 100% return that everyone had been notified. And we had to whittle those down to, to 10 that we had received to date that we were able to do what we called administrative review to see if there was a vested interest in the zoning or other factors that would lead us to recommend uh, a change in what we were initially going to uh, recommend in the, in the zoning map. Um, if you'll look on the second page of the handout that I provided you, there are five property owners represented representing six properties that we are recommending a revision to what we initially recommended for the zoning map based on what is called for in the comprehensive plan and the future development map. What we want to do is make sure that if we were identifying properties over here that are not consistent with the future development map, and that was one of the reasons why we were not supportive of that change, then on the other hand, you have to give the same credit to those that are consistent with the future land use map and go ahead not to remove their zoning and put something else in its place. But if they are already zoned in, uh, 
in, in, in consistent with the future land use map, that we go ahead and allow them to keep that. So we've identified out of those 14 objections, we've identified these six properties right off the bat. Those are already consistent with, and there's really no reason to, ch to uh, change them. Um, they're consistent with the zoning that's surrounding them. Um, and it makes it easier from uh, the standpoint of having to bring this to the planning commission and to this board, not to inconvenience the, these folks when it's likely that our initial effort would not really be legally supported. I will leave that to uh, David when he gets back, but that's, that's our recommendation to the changes based on the appeals that we had been given. Now that said, um, we have essentially uh, a list of property owners here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The, there, there, there were some in here actually that did not respond to have an appeal that we've actually addressed with respect to the analysis of the COP plan. So the Robert Leathers properties, those have been addressed. Uh, I'm on page three, by the way, the last page. Uh, BAPU Industries has withdrawn. So the only there's only four properties that were on the list of objectors that have yet to file an appeal. And the adoption of the ordinance is going to be the trigger date, which gives them a 60-day window in which they will file an appeal. Now that said, because we had planned to adopt the ordinance back in, in April, we're going to serve them notice again that, this, that the clock is now ticking to make sure that they're aware. Um, as well, there are uh, four property owners representing seven properties, I believe, that really failed to meet any threshold we had. Comp plan consistency, uh, development files, concept plans approved, permits approved. None of that actually applied. These are undeveloped tracts of land that we were not able to uh, make a recommended change on based on certain criteria that we were looking at in the uh, technical, uh, the uh, administrative review. Those items will specifically be forwarded to the city, to the uh, planning commission and the city council upon the adoption of the ordinance. Uh, and that does not exclude any others from moving forward if they, if anyone else would like to, um, to uh, appeal their, their zoning change, uh, then they certainly have that window in which to do that. 60 days from the date that this is finally approved, right? Yes, sir. And you're sending new uh, notices when you do that? Correct. Okay. Um, I've spent a lot of time looking at this and uh, through a number of meetings. So let me ask council if any of you have any questions. And again, we're not going to be able to get to any legal questions tonight because we don't have the city attorney here. So if your question is of a legal nature, we're not going to resolve this tonight anyway. We can't. We have to have a public hearing on Tuesday. Chris. Uh, so the zoning map that's inside the packet, I think I just saw in small print that it says it does say July 14th. So this is this would be what the zoning map would look like once um, the ordinance assuming assumingly would be approved Tuesday night. Um, I can't pop and tell that because I don't know what you're looking at. Okay, it was just the one that was uploaded. Okay. That in it's there, the so. map that you actually have in your packet. Yeah. Okay, if it's the one that I, if it's the one I gave her, then yes, that's correct. Okay. It's the, okay. That's the corrected version. Let me, this is the corrected version? Yes. Uh, with, with your changes, the ones that you have in, administratively yes. right. made correct. a decision. So I haven't actually yes, that is looked that's at the this accurate. one. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's a good question. I didn't know that this was the updated one. Okay. I thought you may still make some changes before Tuesday, and you may, but we'll. Yeah, if you do, you'll let us know. There's one that I have a question about one part. Okay. Uh, Mr. Young, you looked like you had a question. No, I'm just saying to resolve it down to, to five, uh, five owner, four owners and seven properties. It's amazing. I agree. A lot of work. Thank you, Chris. You did a good job. It's certainly been uh, a cumbersome task, and we appreciate all the work you've done on it. And uh, especially considering, going back to Councilman Young's uh, point about mistakes and 
and the things that went on in the past. I mean, somebody's going to look back in 10 years and say we did the same thing, I'm sure. But right. the point <laughs> is that we know that we're constantly evolving and correcting, and you've been a big part of that with, with this uh, rezoning. And we appreciate the work you put into this. Anybody else? Uh, it says that this is um, adopted on July the 14th. Are you planning on having this adopted Tuesday? Yes, sir. As long as Mr. Macklin, Macklin is here, then we will. If he is not here, we will not. Okay. And that will be, of course, will be amended to, ref that's just to reflect <laughs> the official zoning The map. intent, I yeah. understand. Yeah. Yeah. My only question is, uh, what was Tom's question? Because he had to say he had a question, so. Yeah, Chris, tell him the difference between the legal requirement for notification and what we've talked about doing. Well, the legal requirement for notification would be that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge under the uh, Georgia Zoning Procedures Law. Um, when you're talking about a citywide rezoning, we're talking about over 6,500 properties individually. And everyone, every, I mean, literally every single property in the city is being rezoned because we're getting away from the existing zoning classification. So you're R1, your, your R20, which is your only single family, is now being broken down into R1 and R2. Your uh, downtown overlays, there's five overlays. Those are consolidated just into zoning districts. We're not, we're not gonna do all these additional uh, overlays on things. It just makes things really too, too cumbersome. Uh, you've got multifamily one and two, whereas before you just had one. Uh, you've got uh, two industrials, you've got a la a layers of commercial, but it, my, my point is that if we ha we cannot literally notify, you know, by certified mail every single property, it, that would be astronomically expensive. I mean, it's $7 per, per letter times, you know, 6,500 plus. So that said, what we did was we identified those that were substantially different from what they were going to be zoned from what they currently are. Those we, of course, notified uh, by certified mail and then set apart, uh, set down a process by which uh, an objection and appeal could be made. And then that process has then gone through the administrative portion and is now moving on to the planning commission and the city council. I don't know if that answers uh, Tom's question about Parley. Parley. You want to pick up the that, rest? Well, I mean, the, the, um, the step of this, and I'm not a PNZ guy, right? The step of this that seemed extra to me is, and we had this argument with David a couple of times, is we didn't feel like that a person could appeal a rezoning until it was rezoned. So the first letter that Chris sent was an intent to rezone, which I don't know that that was required. Right? Is that did we just agree to do that? I I think is that would required? be well. I think that would be the right thing to do. Well, no, is yeah. it legally required though? I would say yes. You think? Okay. Yeah. So we but we did it anyway, whether it was yeah. required or not. We we notified people up front, and then as it happened with the virus. They, they've had even more time to respond, to object, and to, and to file an official appeal, right? Yes. So I don't have any illusions about us not getting criticized for what we're doing by somebody, maybe a bunch of somebodies. But, I mean, we have tried to communicate. But, well. even, but even in the certifications, we didn't get 100% signatures. So we still run the risk of somebody saying, I didn't know. And if you remember when we were doing the HPC designation, you know, the, with the 10 properties or however many it was, Ron, you know, one of, one of the complaints that was made by a sitting council person at the time was that the people that we mailed to that did not receive or sign the certified letter effectively didn't know, right? And that we hadn't reached out to them. So, I mean, it's almost like there's no end to the requirement, not the legal requirement on our part to communicate, but the, 
but sort of the practical requirement that we would actually go try to knock on doors and track people down and say, hey, you need to know what we're doing. So I feel like Chris really has made the effort, but I don't want y'all to go into this thinking that we're not going to get criticized by somebody because somebody is going to come back to us and say, I didn't know you were doing this. Okay. Let, let me point this out now I'm that council person uh, who, who said that and I still believe that but again these are uh, questions of law and I would like to uh, have David weigh in on that when we get to it but I do think that in some ways Chris has resolved part of our question about notice because once this is passed assuming that it's pa if it passes Tuesday he is going to then send out certified letters again, again and time. notify of this 60-day notice so uh, you know again I, I don't want to and I won't get off into the legal part of that but I think that we are going above and beyond at least to the extent that I understand how David has explained it to us uh, going forward so with that any other questions from council what did you just hand us uh, <coughs> to uh, uh, Tom's point what this is is the 10 properties that never responded to the uh, initial intent to rezone and I wanted you to feel comfortable in looking at each individual one what they're currently zoned, what they're being proposed for and so you can have a visual picture of what it is and, and why they don't match uh, it, it, limited industrial <laughs> yes yes exactly yeah. makes the point um, I just want you to understand. I just want you to be comfortable with the fact that we didn't that we did not receive a notice that they had actually picked up their letters. That it's that we're not doing the right thing moving forward. Right. Okay. I understand what you're saying. What this, just a cursory <coughs> review of this uh, looks as though you're right on target. Yes, ma'am. On this page, uh, on this Thomas Dorsey. Um, is this the last page? Yeah, the last page. That's a church building. Yes. And so, um, I saw on one of the others a person name that goes to that church. So, mm -hmm. is it? How do you do that? Would he? Well, there, or there would that person. Well, there are two properties that are associated with that church. Mm -hmm. that are currently zoned commercial mixed use. Uh, I wouldn't really say a church or a cemetery falls in under that category. Um, under the new zoning, uh, churches are not in, located in the commercial mixed use district. So we wanted to apply a zoning to them where they would be legally conforming. All the surrounding area is zoned R2 and so the church and the cemetery would also be zoned R2 to join the rest of it so that everyone was legally conforming. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything as far as the use of the church or the value of the church or the parking lot. It just, it just makes it so that they are conforming to oh, the new Oh, it's just zoning. a matter of being rezoned? Pardon? It's, it's just a matter of being rezoned? Yes. Is it, okay. Mm -hmm. And so you keep saying something about the cemetery, and then the cemetery is right beside the church. So right. that's considered part of the partial for the church, or is that two separate? They're two separate parcels. But this is just the list. This is just the list of folks that we sent the initial letters out that never responded to us. Okay. So who was this? This was sent to the church or to a member of the church? Um, I can get you that information. Oh, okay. okay. We we'll talk um, about it. We we'll talk about it. Well, but let me ask a question. Can you help us with that, with the uh, notification? I probably can. That's okay. what I was asking the, the right. question. Right, good. Uh -huh. we, 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 we have it. Um, but let me ask you a question on this, yes. uh, because I'm not a, uh, a, a zoning specialist either, but a church, if someone wanted to have a church, you wouldn't put that in R2, would you? My question is, what happens if this church burns down? Will they then have, a, have trouble building a new church on R2? No, no, okay. not at all. In fact, if you think about where most of your churches are located, they're located next to your neighborhoods. 
They're not, you know, all, they seem all like O and I, insta uh, you know, zombies to me. Yeah, because yeah. it, it, it may be a little one in a in a strip center, and then there's ones right within homes and residential areas. Yeah, yeah and, and to that point, I mean, we're, we, we're careful not to make a distinction between the church and any other uh, place for assembly, you know, like a theater or something like that. Um, we, there are places where churches don't do well, such as like right on 78 in downtown or on Main Street in downtown and the, the small storefronts because they don't necessarily attract uh, commerce and foot traffic during business hours, uh, which benefits everybody else. Um, I don't want to get too far in the weeds with this, but uh, there, there are other zoning districts, not just R2 and R1 that permit churches, but there are also ones that where it is excluded to the benefit of the surrounding uh, businesses. And so we just want to make sure that they're corrected and they're in the right place okay. so that uh, even though they didn't respond to us, we're still taking care of. Okay. As as I, maybe Ms. March. As I recall, in, in, the, in the zoning ordinance, there's, it talks about certain kinds of structures assume the characteristics of the, the properties around them, like, like a daycare and, and a church. And they, I think that was stated inside the zoning ordinance, wasn't it? Uh, I would have to look at that specifically. Uh, I know that we look at general i'm sorry i know we look at uh the types of zoning that are well the type of uses that are allowed in the zone and how those uses are compatible with the character of the surrounding area certainly okay are there any more questions i asked my hundreds of questions before the virus hit and if i had a question now i wouldn't remember it right it's been <laughs> so long i tried to get all mine asked back then i'm sure there's some things we're going to want to tweak going forward but thank you so much for the amount of time that's gone into this trying to contact people then working with people it sounds like from the report you've given us and everything we've heard whether it's from Tom and that we've talked about that as much as possible people's property rights and desires were protected absolutely and that was that was a big concern and it looks like the numbers, as I looked at the report even before you gave us the hard copy, whatever was sent to us electronically, that the numbers really dwindled down in the appeals. And I realize more could pop up out of the list, but that's very encouraging. That w the Administratively, corrections, yeah. we've gotten down to a much smaller amount to deal with, so that's good to know. So Chris, uh, assuming that the ordinance gets adopted Tuesday night, how many follow-up letters do you anticipate sending again? Well, we've already received 10 appeals okay. out of 17. So we would be sending seven letters. Seven letters. So, and, so, and that's going to be some of these here that didn't respond the first time? Correct. And so, I mean, one thing I do, just as a matter of practice, when I send a certified letter, is I also send one by regular first-class mail, too. Yeah, I agree. Cause, so, I mean, I don't know if that's something you considered, but perhaps we can well, do that. Well, you know, to that point, uh, the certified letters that we sent for the zoning appeals, every one of them was picked up. Okay. So. Right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any more questions? All right. So we're going to, uh, we got a couple more things to cover. Then we will uh, provide time for our public comments if that is, uh, if anybody wants to do that. Let me first tell the council that those items we requested from Wesley have been loaded into the work session. Do you, has anybody had an opportunity to look at those? Do you want to? Do you feel like that would give you time, you, you would have time now to flip through it? Let's just, let's take just a, uh, a, fi a five minute break uh, and, and let everybody take a look at those and see if we can resolve them today. Tom, you want to update us on anything while folks are looking around? Well, I mean, they need to. Well, they sort of do, but they're only barely listening to you anyway. Obviously, he does not understand attention deficit. <laughs> Trying to listen to you, right? You have to say to Oh, believe me, I understand it. <laughs> yeah, you probably do one, one of those times. I've seen a lot of it. Yeah, I had a conversation with Chris today and told him there's sometimes when he starts talking, I start thinking about the Braves, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I heard you say that. 
he was actually referring to a conversation I was having. He said, when I started talking, he started thinking about the grave. Why are you giving me that look? This is the longest work session I've ever had. You'll be all right. <laughs> we did good. I was hoping we could do it in two hours. Oh, yeah, we did skip a month. When you I'm on the last one, Wesley. When you consider we haven't met since May, I think we did really well. Tom, do you know if the uh, website and the POS system proposed will play nice together? No. That's something we need to know. Well, I don't know if we're going they, to know it will. that. On the okay. Front. Wesley, let me get you to come on up and you can start giving us an abbreviated uh, version of your three items again, okay? They'll have it in front of them to take a look at. I just skimmed through them. So let's just start with your items again. Uh, uh, professional services for architectural design and documentation. Let's start with that one. Right. This is three different projects that we've had in the in the pipeline for a long time. The big one being the barn, which will feed the petting zoo. It's also the mine shaft that goes to the bottom of the mine shaft, and then these <coughs> covered entrances that will seal the tunnel but allow us to access it in a controlled way and you can actually see in the the this is a, an actual photograph of what that would look like so when we were talking about controlling the ongoing graffiti and it, it's going to have a door on it so i mean we could we'll put padlock on it and, and restrict access to you know somebody's not going to be there with a staff member they're not getting inside Will you pass that around? Sure. Uh, we have it, but it's turned sideways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's easier to see. It's actually easier for me to see from there, even. Start. Yeah. We had a few documents like that. I was like doing this. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. That actually gives me a better vision of what we're doing here. This and again, that's entirely my fault. That was. That's the entrance. Would you explain that again while they're able to look at it? So that's an actual historical historic photograph of what the kind of mine shaft entrance would look like mm -hmm. and we would have probably the goal would be to have four we'd need to have at least uh two constructed immediately this is a map showing the location on the property so just to make sure that you're confused adequately <laughs> The mine shaft is not a shaft, it's a hole. Open, open pit gold mine. Right. But the mine tunnel is a tunnel through the mountain. Right. Hmm. So if you've not been up there and seen it, I don't know how you even understand what he's talking about. Because if I had not seen it, I'd have no concept of this. So so Aren't the we tunnel plan that we're going to put the, the entrance over is like a Wiley e. Coyote type hole in the rock that just goes right through the mountain. But the, the mine shaft is, looks like a giant sinkhole. And so that staircase would go down to a platform near the bottom so you could go down inside of the mine. Right now, I can't take anybody on a mine tour. I, I can't take them in the tunnel. I can't take them down in that open pit. But with the staircase, I could. Okay. And they would both be locked at certain points so that we wouldn't have you know, teenagers down there doing dumb teenager things at all times of the day and night and getting into trouble, whatever. If we were kids, I'm telling you, how many times I've been over there, I thought, if we were kids, this is where we would play. Yeah. Right. And I think about that because I take the little one the little one and the medium one over there, and there are some areas where you're like, 
kids would go in there and it's not safe. Yeah. And I'll go, see guys, we just feel the air conditioning from this area. We do not go beyond right. this part. And then I tell them something scary, like you don't know what's in there, you know, like a snake or something. But what I, I know where, <laughs> and worse, right? Um, it really would be a great place. I know where the big hole is. Where's the tunnel? Which one of that am I looking at when you're on the back side of the trail? If you, were, or? if you were facing that open pit, uh -huh. the tunnel actually goes underneath your feet on the left. Okay. So if you walk to the left and take the first trail on the left, it goes to the home site. But before it gets to the home site, it passes the south entrance, or north, excuse me, north entrance of that tunnel. And the tunnel comes out on the back side of the mountain. Okay. But again. Okay. I never knew that was there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think we need to get a field trip out there. Yeah. yeah. We took oh, one sure. years ago. And it is when, very when do you think that might be feasible? I know we've been uh, closed nice. up. What did you say, Tom? You said not on Mondays. He's not on Mondays. Any day but Monday, he's out there. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, think about it. Okay. So, council, before you, you have the uh, the proposal. Uh, this is that the that first item for thirty thousand two hundred twenty-five dollars. Uh, are there any more questions for Wesley? Now that you have the backup material. Okay. Again, maybe not. You got something Go over there? Okay. Um, I just want to be really clear on this because if I were sitting in the audience of a regular council meeting and looked at some of these items and what we're going to spend in this and that, I'd be going, how do we have money for that? And I'm saying this because, you know, I'm a fiscal hawk, so <laughs> I'm watching my, especially when it comes down to needs and wants. And people need to be clear, and probably most people won't see this meeting. I'll have to probably put in an email to people and that sort of thing. but. There is a reason why some of this can be done. Because when you gave your budget, you know, all the things you wanted, and I'm like, yeah, when hell freezes over. I mean, almost, it was great, though. I mean, it was inspirational, but I'm going, can't do all that stuff. Right, Tom? Can't do all that stuff. I mean, we've got leaks. We've got stuff. Right. What makes some of this be able to happen is because it's on the Douglas County side, Splossed on the Douglas County side can only be used on the Douglas County side, and and we're it. <laughs> argue with me if it's wrong. I mean, argue with me no. if we haven't fixed the other things over there. Well, it, that it's all I in believe buckets. is the, the only reason we can move forward. Right. That, I mean, that's the point. Forward. It's not right. just that it's splossed; it's how it's designated. But that's where this money's coming from, and that's what the. The uh, cover sheet says it's in certain. It says spots, spots but it doesn't say Douglas County. So that well, it has to be because it's in Douglas County. Right. But, so but citizens I understand. need. To, I just want to make sure citizens need to understand the reason we can do some of these extras is because of the fact of the way the splost has to be sent, spent percentage-wise on the Douglas County side, and it would be different if it were on the Carroll side. It really would. It, it would. It, we actually had that discussion internally Which out is there. why I don't have a problem with this, but I might if it was on the Carroll, because of our other stuff. But right. the pots are set up a certain percentage. And we, it we looks set like up we can to, do this. Uh, a discussion internally amongst the staff, because we expect that there'll be some folks that will question us as to, you know, with everything that's going on in the world, how are you doing this right now? And we can say that there's a specific, explain just like you just did basically to two people that come to us with a, not a complaint, but a concern. Um, so yeah, we're conscious of that and sympathetic to it. Okay, any other questions? I, I think he needs to clear up his documentation and point out this is the Douglas County Sploss money. This right now it looks like it could be coming from anywhere. It just says Sploss. Douglas County Sploss. I, I can do that. That. Okay, that being the case, I'm not going to be able to put it on the consent agenda, so uh, we'll strike that one. Let's move on to number two. You need to update your cover sheet to, to identify it as Douglas County Sploss. Same thing on all three it, of them. It's the same thing. Are they all, all three like three that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then I wasted all of our time trying to get to a consent agenda. Those are off. Okay. We put a bunch on there, though. Yeah. We, yeah, with those three. Yeah, but Wesley, they don't want to come back. So that, that was way. All right, let's move on. Thank you, Wesley. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Wesley. No, that wouldn't call it the first time around. Okay, let's move on to the next item. 
human resources. That's right, but we got we got a couple other things first. All right, so tonight I'm going to announce that earlier today um, I signed an order for that applies to the city of Villarica buildings and city employees. Uh, we'll have a moment for discussion in a few minutes, but let me tell you what we've had going on. Uh, our city attorney is not here tonight uh, because he uh, contracted COVID-19 and therefore he couldn't be here tonight. He will uh, be tested again tomorrow if he is uh, uh, negative, then he will be here on Tuesday night. If he is not, then he will not be here on Tuesday night. Last week, one of our crew members on our roads crew uh, tested positive for COVID-19 and we had to send him home and then we had to send that entire team home uh, due to protocols with the CDC. That being the case, it became evident to me that we should as a city do as much as we can to protect our city employees uh, and to that end, uh, the order is that all employees and all citizens who enter public buildings will be required to wear face coverings as outlined in that order. It, those face coverings are defined. Uh, they are to cover your mouth and nose and they will be provided for those who show up at a public building such as the library, city hall, uh, any other public building that you would normally go into. If you object to wearing the mask, there will also be uh, ways for you to do your business online or through the telephone. Um, so we feel like we are weighing the interest of our employees uh, because we are not just a local government, we are an employer and we have duties to uh, our employees and that is the basis for for that order. With that being said, I did want to do it tonight. Uh, although I've already signed this order and put it out, the, the point of tonight is that the council should have an opportunity to weigh in uh, and if they choose to do something different on Tuesday night when you can actually vote, then they may do that. If they do not, uh, at least they had an opportunity to speak. With that being said, are there any comments from any council members? Mr. Young. I am opposed to mandatory mask orders. And I provided the city council with a, a selection of articles that talk about masks. The first one I gave them was from the Gateway Pundit. It's titled, Masks Are Symbolic, say Dr. Fauci, who is a, a national expert on, on coronavirus, and the New England Journal of Medicine. And that article was published May 28th. The, uh, by Bill Hennessy, and it states, in the past week, Dr. Anthony Fauci and the New England Journal of Medicine have admitted that masks are little more than symbols, virtue sig signaling. For those of you who shout science, it's like a turret tick. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine on May 21st, they stated, we know that wearing a mask outside of healthcare facilities offers little, if any, protection from infection. Public health authorities define a significant exposure to COVID-19 as face-to-face -face contact within six feet of a patient with symptomatic COVID-19 that is sustained for at least a few minutes, and some say more than 10 minutes or even 30 minutes. The chance of catching COVID-19 from a passing interaction in a public space is therefore minimal. In many cases, the desire for widespread masking is a reflective action to anxiety over pandemic. So why are we ordered to wear masks? Symbolism. From the same article in the New England Journal of Medicine, it also states, it is also clear that masks serve symbolic roles. Masks are not only tools, but they are talismans that may help increase healthcare workers' perceived sense of safety, well-being, and trust in their hospitals. The Surgeon General was widely mocked and ridiculed for suggesting in March that masks might even increase the spread of the virus, the Surgeon General. Yet, here, the esteemed New England Journal of Medicine provides the same warning to mask wearers. They states, what is clear, however, is that a universal masking alone is not a pan panacea. A mask will not protect providers caring for a patient with active COVID-19 
if it is not accompanied by meticulous hand hygiene, eye protection, gloves, and a gown. A mask alone will not protect, protect, prevent health care workers with early COVID-19 from contaminating their hands and spreading the virus to patients and colleagues. Focusing on universal masking alone, paradoxically, lead to more transmission of COVID-19 if it diverts attention from implementing more fundamental infection control measures. Thus the argument is over. Anyone who advocates universal masking is merely engaging in virtue signaling, not public health. Okay. The next. Oh, how many of these? The next. To? Well, a few of them. Okay. The ne next piece of paper I provided was Webster's definition of symbolism. The art or practice of using symbols, especially by investing things with a symbolic meaning or by expressing the invi invisible or intangible by means of visible or sensuous representation. Basically, this is saying you are presenting something as an intangible truth. I've got one more I want to talk about, and then, but there, there were a lot. This one is from Hot Air, and it's, it's posted today. Atlanta mayor. Okay, now that I have the virus, everyone else has to wear masks. And it's a long article, but one of the things I want to point out is uh, on the second page of the article, down toward the bottom, but as I suggested, that's not the real sticking point. The potential problem is that Georgia Governor Brian Kemp has already issued an executive order of his own. As NPR reported Tuesday, that mandate forbids local governments from ordering their own health policies. Neither of these orders has ever been taken up by the legislatures in question. So it's a face-off between executive branches at the state and municipal level. Okay. Any, anyone yeah, else? Yeah. I, I have a hard time believing Mr. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fawcett when he's sitting behind the president with a mask I on. I the same and, thing. And he says they're not. thousand words. They're not uh, even effective, but there he is wearing one. And then after I heard him comment that the uh, death rate reduction, the reduction in the death rate due to this virus, doesn't mean anything. Uh, I, I kind of question what he was saying when he started saying things like that. I, I, I too at times have said, were you lying to us then or are you lying to us now? I am also very skeptical of some things when they tell us, don't wear a mask, it won't help, and then weeks later, you need to wear a mask. And then they say, well, the reason we told the American people not to wear a mask is because we needed them for the first responders. And we didn't want them to take up what other people, first responders and others needed. So they didn't trust the American people to say tell them the truth and say, don't go get masks. We really need them for the vital people. We need them to be protected. Instead of trusting the American people in general to follow, maybe not everybody, they chose to, according to them, tell us a falsehood, but then ask us to now believe them when they change the story. And that is not helpful in having people trust. Um, I, too, am very skeptical about the mask wearing, but I also, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not an expert, and I'm struggling with who to believe. So, but I know for some people, it may make them feel better. I'm not about that. Forget the symbolism. But maybe it does help to some degree. So I agreed to it, although... I'm tied in with some of what Michael's saying, but I want us to, as much as possible, give employees freedom. If they're outside working by themselves, for instance, or like in City Hall, though, if they're, we talked about this on the phone, if they're in the office by themselves, they don't, please make it clear that you don't need to be wearing that thing when you're in office by yourself. You know, when you're gonna be, I guess, passing through, sitting at desk together, it uh, maybe it'll it helps in some way maybe i just want to make sure they've got that freedom to not be stuck wearing that thing all the time when they're not even around somebody thank you anybody else 
I'm just generally, <clears throat> I would say, you know, I'm a mask skeptic as well, but I do wear one out of precaution in certain situations. I'm just concerned with the operations of the city, and to be frank, us five members up here can't manage Parks and Rec, P and Z, and the the rest of the functions of this city if um, our, there's an outbreak within our our city staff. So I don't see how it hurts. I guess there may be some signs of how it does hurt. I don't know. It's hurt. Again, like Leslie, it's I don't mandated, know. mandated, it's hurt. Yeah, I just don't know. If it's a choice, that's something completely different. At the same time, though, Michael, we, you know, the city is an employer, and, you know, your, your employer can tell you you can't get a tattoo or you have to cover a tattoo up. So as an employer, I think we have the power to um, ask our employees to do things that will help the overall um, staff and city functions. And if we truly believe it will help in some sort of, do, some sort of way, possibly, people need to be clear about how to wear a mask. Because it does, I know it does no good when they do certain things. It like your hands are all over your face and you're adjusting your hands are, I mean. And a mask does no good when you have facial hair. It defeats the purpose, so. Okay, anybody else have any comments? Um, one thing, we have a city hall of people that are sitting around and if someone walked in with the virus, and started spreading that thing around the city hall, it could easily shut the city down. I would rather err on the side of caution than not err, than have the city shut down. Okay, and I appreciate that. Anybody else? So let me just say from my standpoint, I'm not going to argue uh, any of this. I, I respect everybody's opinion. Michael has, has expressed his opinion to me before we got here tonight. He has expressed that same opinion uh, more than once uh, on a, a couple of different matters, and, and uh, I'm not going to, uh, to, to question any part of it. I appreciate you saying what, what's on your mind. Um, to that extent, though, to, to, to that end, tomorrow uh, there will be a campaign started here. Uh, the city clerk will begin to post information out for us to encourage citizens to mask up, to wear masks. We will also post a video from the uh, Surgeon General of the, of the uh, United States uh, as he teaches you how to make your own mask at home. Uh, and we will do what we can to encourage people to wear masks. I have not attempted to mandate anything for the citizenry at large. I am just trying to protect as best I can, our employees and in city buildings. And to that extent, I can do that. Uh, I did see your reference about what the governor had done and what he thinks the limit might be, but that does not apply to employers. Um, that being said, I think that doing this was about me and this council and this city and our city manager doing what we thought was our dead level best to protect people uh, that, that work for us and to, who do the work for us every day. Um, I don't like mandating anything, but I will just point this out. When we were talking about uh, Punkin Town Road earlier today, the statement was made, people don't make the right decisions. And I am not asking our employees to depend on others to be responsible and make the right decisions. Okay, Mr. Barber, do you have anything else to add? Okay, with that being the uh, case, we will close out. This is the longest work session I've ever had. Did you want to go review the consent items? Yes, sir, I do. Just, just as a matter of review, let me, let me tell you what's on the consent agenda, and please in, in, interrupt if I've missed something. Uh, item A1, uh, let's not do it like that. Let's just, let me call it, because I don't know how it's going to show up on the final All agenda. Right. Culvert replacements, industrial park roads prior to paving pipe material for industrial park culvert replacements, price quotation on further engineering study of Punkintown Road speed limit reduction, purchase of one John Deere Gator Model TS, Pine Mountain Gold Museum crossing arms, bid award for construction of Highway 78 water main extension, 
bid award for the construction of Edge Road Water Main Extension, uh, Gradit Communications Video Stream, Professional Services Agreement for Gold Dust Splash Pad, Work Order with Brennan Jones to evaluate the sewer system along Anderson Road and the Cleghorn Lift Station, Work Order with Brennan Jones for Nally Road Sewer Review, and professional services with Falcon Design Consultants for oversight of construction projects. Did I miss anything? Nope. Madam Clerk, do you have that? Okay, we're adjourned. Whoa. Well, I, it's, it's, it's my strength. It's all that time at the gym, right? No, we only had an hour. Well, I mean before that. No, yeah. And you see the two and a half hours for, ta for taking off. Telling me for fifteen minutes, it's time to go. For